Howdy, New Spring. I uh, hope you're having a great summer. Uh, I am, and I, but I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce today's speaker. Um, before I introduce the speaker, though, um, I want to read some scripture that kind of sets this up. It's really cool. It's found in the book of Psalm, chapter 145, and you don't have to turn there. We're going to put the scripture for you up on the screen, and it says this. It says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Now pay special attention to verse 4 because this is where it's really going to kick in. One generation will commend your works to another. They, were, they will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glories, glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell the power of your awesome works, and I will pro proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Bible says that one generation will tell another generation about the awesomeness of God. And we know that when one generation speaks into or pours into another generation about who God is and what God can do and who Jesus Christ is, that really does impact the next generation. One of the prayers that we've had here at New Spring Church since we began back in 2000 is that the next generation would be impacted for Christ. And as a result, that they would actually take ministry and this church to another level in their generation than my generation. I'm, I'm 40, so if you're around my area, um, anyone our age that, that we could ever take it to. And I believe the next generation has the potential in them to lead the greatest revival that the world has ever seen. So with that in mind, um, I want to introduce today's speaker. His name is Caleb White. Um, many people at the Anderson campus, you know Caleb. Um, he's been around for a really long time. But I'll tell you why Caleb is particularly special today and why I'm just so pumped up about Caleb speaking. Caleb is the result of one generation commending the works of God to another generation. Let me tell you what I mean. Caleb first started coming to New Spring Church when he was the, in the seventh grade. And I'll be honest with you, the church was small enough that I knew Caleb when he showed up and all I knew him as was the annoying red-headed kid that would not shut up. I mean, he was he was that kid, I'm telling you. But he uh, he kept coming, um, he kept attending faith, faithfully. Both of his parents were plugged in, still are plugged in, volunteers. In his ninth grade year, after his ninth grade year, he received Christ at New Spring Church. In fact, he received Christ at the gauntlet. And when he received Christ, Jesus changed his life. He got plugged into ministry here at New Spring Church. He was volunteering. And after that, he, um, he started leading some worship. He started doing some amazing things. And now Caleb is a full-time staff member at New Spring Church. Caleb, this is to, so today, today marks history for us because it's the first time that we're seeing someone walk on the stage and he's literally going to preach the gospel. And he is the result of God raising up a church that pours into the next generation. Today marks history as we're going to see the first step of the next generation literally telling everybody how good God is. So I want everybody on every campus right now to put your hands together and welcome my friend Caleb White to the New Spring Stage. Man. Thank you, Jesus. Man, thank you, Jesus. Hey, everybody, I hope... Uh, 
You're all doing amazing today. Uh, thank you, Pastor Perry, for, for that. Uh, my name is Caleb, and I, I work with the, the student ministry here at our church, the Fuse Student Ministry. I was a worship leader when I first started working at the church, and I have gradually moved on to a role called a creative director. So they kind of just pay me to hang out with your kids these days, and it is awesome. So, hey, listen, um, seriously, it is an honor, the biggest honor of my life to be on this stage today. Um, to share with my church, the church that I, I belong to this church. I love this church. God has done an unbelievable amount of work in my life inside of this church. And so um, for me to just stand on stage today and just get to share with you guys a message that I think God has laid on my heart, it is the biggest honor of my life. And so um, I'm very grateful that each of you come out today, uh, especially if you're brand new or if you don't know what's going on in our church Thank you. It means a whole lot you come and spend the morning or the day with us here today. And so uh, let me just let you know about a couple things going on in our church real fast across every single campus. Uh, we have something going on called the 90-Day Tithe Challenge. You might have heard about it at your campus today. But we honestly believe, we are completely convinced here at our church that there is no way that we can outgive God. We believe that the Bible says that God is incredibly generous that he delights in giving gifts and giving good things to those of us who belong to him. And so we want you to just take us up to take God up on his promise in the Bible. He, he commands us because we're, again, let me, just, let me just say this. There's some of us here today that we call, we call ourselves Christians, okay? And we believe that Jesus has taken all of our punishment. And so we are now right with God. We have our relationship with God, our Father, restored. And so we're, we're, those of us who are Christians in here today, the Bible says that 100% of our lives, 100% of our money, 100% of everything that we have belongs to God. And so in the Bible, he says to bring, right, because it's his in the first place. We're not, we're not really giving anything because it's all his. We're commanded to bring the first 10% to him and he then will bless it and, and allow us the privilege and the honor of stewarding the other 90%. And so if you have never started tithing, you're missing out. I promise you, you're missing out on God's blessing on your financial situation. And so we as a church, we put our money where our mouth is. If you take this 90-day challenge and you've never started tithing, go by guest services on your way out today. Start tithing, and at the end of this 90 days, after you bring the first 10%, the very first 10% of everything that you make, you bring that to God. At the end of this 90 days, if you haven't seen God's favor and God's blessing on your money, we will give you 100% of what you've given back. I promise you, God is faithful. He makes promises, and he keeps them, and he will come through on that. So that's for those of you who maybe you haven't decided to start tithing yet, but for the rest of us, we've been convinced at some point that God is faithful, and so we, we do tithe. Well, we have this, um, this thing going on in our church right now called take the land it's a it's a giving initiative and it's just because we're growing as a church god is at work in our church it's the biggest blessing on our church right now but that being said there's some things that we need you guys we're, we're adding more campuses god is bringing people out to our churches to hear the gospel and so that being said god's calling some people in in this room across our church to give so pray over that see what god would want you to give and, and let me just challenge you with this don't contribute comfortably don't spend, don't, don't give enough to where you, you got some in the bank in case something goes wrong. Cash all your chips in on the table and watch God come through for you because I promise that he will. I am the product of a generation of people that not only have poured into me the Bible and that Jesus loves me, but have also invested and sacrificed so that my generation could be could start here instead of down here. So thank you for everyone that gives. Um, we have an, an, one more thing going on. We have a really, really awesome opportunity for people in this church to sign up to volunteer at this camp that we have every year for students called The Gauntlet. You heard Pastor Perry in the introduction um, mention it. I got saved at The Gauntlet. I met Jesus at The Gauntlet, and there are 1,950 kids signed up to go this year. God knows we need help down there. We need a lot of... Um, there's going to be a lot of annoying little redhead kids that won't shut up down there at the gauntlet <laughs> that are one day going to have an unbelievable future in this church. And we have an opportunity this morning, today, for some of us to sign up and volunteer. So if God is, is calling you to do that, please do that. So uh, all that being said, we're going to get started this morning. We're in this series called Weird. Um, and today we're, if you want to write this down, we are writing, we are talking about the subject of weird worship. 
Okay, and I understand that worship is a very, uh, it's a very churchy word. It's a very, you know, you, you hear it if you grew up in church or if you didn't, you kind of would maybe associate worship with church. Um, and so I, I don't want that to get lost in translation this morning. I want to give you a very clear definition for what worship is and how we're going to be talking about it this morning. So if you have your pen, you want to write this down. Worship this morning for us is to deeply respect and love. Worship is a deep respect and a love for someone or for something. So when I was asking God to to show me, to reveal to me what um, he wanted me to bring to our church this morning, to share with a bunch of uh, brothers and sisters in church this morning, I feel like he brought me to the story in the Bible of a man named Job. Maybe you're familiar with this story of Job. Maybe you're not. Maybe, listen, maybe you've never been to church before. This is awesome. Um, there's a guy in the Bible by the name of Job. It's spelled J-O-B, exactly like Job. I'm kind of just hoping his name is Job, because if I get to heaven one day and he's there and he tells me it's a job, I'm going to feel like a fool, because I've been telling everybody it's Job. So, okay, if you want to flip there in your Bibles, we'll be in Job. It's right before the book of Psalms, which is smack dab in the middle. All right, so open it to the middle and go this way a little bit. So here we go. There's a man in the Bible by the name of Job. If you lived in the land of Uz, which was the name of Job's father. So Job's father's name is Uz. And so the land around him was established by his name. Job lived in the land of his father. If you lived in this land during this time or around this land, you knew who Job was. You were familiar with Job or you worked for Job or something. Job had it. All right. Job was known. The Bible says that he was known for his faith. He's known for his uprightness. Job is a man who had an unbelievable relationship with God. He feared God. He turns away from evil is what it says. But that's not, only, that's not the only thing that Job was known for. The Bible says that Job is incredibly blessed materially. He has 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camel and 500 yoke of oxen. So the things in these days that you would consider wealth and property, Job has tons of it. And Job has 10 kids. His kids are kind of crazy. but So this is who Job was. If you lived in this time, you knew who Job was. All right. So that being said, let's pick the story up. The Bible says this. You can go read this in Job. That God calls together all of the angels. All right. One day, all the sons of God come, and Satan comes to this meeting. And so God says, Satan, where have you been? You know, as though he didn't know, right? Satan, where have you been? Um, And Satan says, you know, I've been going back and forth on the earth. And God, in a bold move here, says, well, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him. He has, he, he, he fears me. He loves me. He worships me. He serves me. And Satan says, well, duh. He has, he has everything he needs. He has everything he wants. Every time he turns around, you're giving him another kid or 500 more camels. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Job is, is blessed. God, of course he would, he would serve you. Of course he would love you. He has everything. He's rich. And God says, no, I, I don't really think that's it, Satan. But to get my point across to you, Satan, everything he has is yours. Just don't touch him. And so one night, Job is at dinner with his wife. And they sit down to eat. And the door swings open. And a servant comes in, sweating. He's in a panic. He says, Job, master, we, we, were, we were feeding the, the camels. We were taking care of the camels. And, and Job, the, the Sabians came. And, and in no time, they, 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 they killed all of the camels and all of the, the servants who were taking care of, of the camels. I, I alone have survived to tell you this, Job, that all of your camels are dead. And as he finishes saying that, the door swings open again and another servant comes in and says, Job, Master, you're not going to believe this, but we, we were getting the sheep back into their pen and, and this fire fell down from heaven. It fell out of nowhere and it burned up all the sheep and all of the keepers of the sheep. I alone have survived to tell you this, Job. All your sheep are dead. And as he's finishing it, you can imagine the heaviness starting to set in. The door opens again. And a servant comes in and says, Master, you're not going to believe this, but the Chaldeans came and, and they formed this group and out of nowhere they killed all of your oxen and all the keepers of the oxen. Job, all your oxen are dead. And so Job can imagine that he reaches over to grab his wife's hand just to say, 
It's just things. That's just money. It's okay. The door opens up. And a servant's standing there and he's just weeping. And he says, Job, we were preparing dinner for your kids. And this storm came and it blew down. Job, all of your children are dead. And so in a matter of minutes, everything that Job is known for, everything that Job had his identity in, everything that Job owned, completely taken away, gone. In a matter of minutes, everything that Job has, gone. But Job responds in a way that we have to wrap our minds around this morning, church. We have to get this right. Because the Bible says that in all of this that happened to Job, he didn't sin. So look at what Job's response is in chapter 1, verse 20. All of this happens and it says, Then Job arose and he tore his robe and shaved his head. He's upset, obviously. But he fell on the ground and he worshipped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So Job's first response is worship. Job's first response is to deeply love and respect a God who sat back and allowed everything he had to be taken away from him. So we have to understand how. I'm young, church, but I'm not dumb. I'm kind of dumb, okay? Okay. <laughs> But this, is, this isn't my response, right? The economy crashes, you lose everything you have. What's, who's the first person to just, oh, God, thank you so much. Bless you, Jesus. Right? So the Bible's not a cold, dead book, church. It applies to every person in this room. And so we are going to unpack this today. But we need some help. So we're going to pray. I want to pray together. And I don't want to take this for granted that anybody knows what prayer is or that you do pray. So let me just unpack this for you. Those of us who belong to God, we believe that not only is there a God in heaven who created the earth, who created the seas, who created the mountains, we believe he talks to us. And we believe that he hears us when we talk to him. And so right here at the beginning of the message, before I say anything else, we're going to talk to God. We're going to ask him to meet us here this morning. And to move us. So let's pray together, church. God, you are way too good to us. And if you don't do anything else for us, God, you've done more than enough. Father, my prayer today with a room full of people that need you to do something for them, God, is that eyes would be open to see you move, that ears would be open to hear your voice. God, that you would move us today to the right kind of deep love and respect. You would move us to worship you today, Jesus. Would you please be here? Please. And all of God's people said, amen. Okay, let me take a sip of water. And we'll get rolling. If you have your outlines, you have a pen with you, you can write this down. Point number one today is this, that worship is about the Lord. Now, this seems incredibly simple, and it's because it is. <clears throat> because if worship church is about the Lord, then it's not about a lot of other things, right? It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about what's going on in my life. It's not about the car I drive, the people I hang out with, the friendships, the relationships that I do or don't have. It's not about any of that. It's not about how much money I have in my bank account. It's not about how many kids I do or don't have. The fact that I am or am not still single has nothing to do with any of that. It's about the Lord. So the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 24, he's writing to a bunch of people just like us, a bunch of people gathered together, except for they're in Rome. And the Bible says this, he's talking about them. See if this sounds like anybody that you would know today, church. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity and to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped 
and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So let me see if this, this kind of hits home with anybody today, church. So he, here's, here's what I know happens. I've, this, this, is, this blows my mind, but coming up in the fall will be the ninth year that I've been a part of what God's doing here at this church. Nine years I've been a part of it. It's awesome. I was a, a student in Fuse for a long time. I've worked with Fuse for a couple of years, and I've seen patterns in our church. I've seen patterns in myself. I've seen, seen this happen with my eyes. I've seen this happen in my life. We, we get on a roll, right? We, maybe God has spoken to you, and you, you take your next step. Maybe you sign up, you get baptized. You join a home group. Maybe you're serving, you're volunteering, you're, you're plugged in. You join a home group. I don't know. You, you, get it, you get going on the right track, right? You feel like you're kind of getting your life in order. You're finally starting to get things figured out. But then something happens, right? And it's a different thing for everybody else. Maybe for some of you today, what happens to you and happens in your life is a tragedy. Maybe you, you, know, you, you, you go to the doctor and you get a result that just ruins your world. Or you sit at home and, and your parents are sitting across the table from each other and they tell you, hey, we're, we're getting a divorce. Maybe you go home and your husband has left a note saying, I'm not coming back. Maybe your spouse or your husband is, is taken away from you. Maybe it's a tragedy that happens, but that's, that's not necessarily the case for all of us. What happens to, to some of us is, is something on the other side of the spectrum. Something starts going your way, right? You get a little bit of money. You, you get a raise. You get what you've been working hard for. You get a new job, a promotion. There's a woman at work starts paying attention to you or... You, you start to see you're getting a little bit of success, right? You're getting a little bit of status. Something's, things are finally starting to go your way. And in no time at all, worship is no longer about the Lord. Right? Like that. Worship's not about God anymore. It's not about who God is and what he's done for us anymore. Now it's about this, whatever this is. It's about my, my circumstances, my situation. Now all of my love and my respect and my attention is, is on this sickness that I have. Now all of my attention, everything that I have, all of my money, all of my resources is going to this that I have now. It's, it's no longer about God. It's no longer about what God has done for you, is doing for you. It's about whatever this is, good or bad. And then if you continue in this pattern long enough, you start to feel empty, right? You know, I mean, come on, we can be honest. This is church, right? This, you don't have to put up any, any, any walls here. Listen, I know this. I've seen this with my own eyes. I've seen this happen in the lives of my friends, in my family. Listen, you run down a path for as long as you want to, trading up, trading up, trading up. This is the next thing I want. And you get to whatever road, you get to the end of that road, and it's completely empty. You have nothing that does nothing for you. And it's because every person in this room, every person across every campus at our church, was created to be satisfied by Jesus alone. It's not Jesus and. It's not Jesus or. It's, it's Jesus. You're satisfied by God, by Jesus and what he has done for you, or you're not satisfied. There's no alternative. And so I promise you, I'm not scared to stand on stage and tell you this today, church. You can spend your entire life worshiping other things. You're going to be empty and miserable. I promise you, there are thousands of people in this church who have a testimony they can tell about it. I was running down this road. It led me nowhere. Now I have a relationship with God, and I'm more satisfied than I ever could have imagined. It stops becoming about the money you have or don't have. It stops becoming about the relationships you have or don't have, the car, the status, the anything you have or don't have. It's not about that anymore. That's why we can stand on stage and tell you, ask God what you want to give. Give it all. Clean out your bank account. Money doesn't matter. Give your home to somebody. Give your car. It doesn't matter. It's not about what you have or don't have. It's about Jesus. And you're either satisfied with what he's done for you or you're not satisfied. It's very simple, church. Worship is about the Lord. And here's the good news for everybody this morning. Point number two, the Lord doesn't change. The book of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, tells us that Jesus Christ 
is the same Jesus yesterday as he is today and as he's going to be forever. He's not changing. Here's how I want to I want to dig in a little bit here because Job is one of the oldest stories, one of the oldest stories in the Bible. Job, um, if you've been to church for a while, you can you, you'll be able to connect with me here. If you're not, just listen up and explain some things about the Bible. Job <coughs> was the son of a man named Uz, who had a father named Nahor. All right, and Nahor had a brother named Abraham. Now, if you grew up reading the Bible or you know anything about the Bible, Abraham was a man that God did a lot of things for, worked miracles in his life. And just to, just to kind of tell you this, God told Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations, but he didn't have his first kid until he was 99. <laughs> 99 years old, he has his first kid. It's unbelievable. But I can imagine... That Job, growing up with this grandfather who's the brother of Abraham, he probably grew up with stories of how good God was, right? Of how God came through on his promises, of how God delivered, despite what it looked like was going to happen. Despite what his circumstances said, despite what the fact he didn't have anything left to his name, despite what it said, God came through and delivered on his promise. And so Abraham's telling his whole family, and so Nahor tells his son and tells his grandkids the story of a God who is good, of a God who does love his kids. And so Job is then able to stand when everything falls apart and just say, so what? So what? God is good. God loves me. Listen to me, church. This is why some of you are grandparents in here this morning. And you need to make sure more seriously than anybody else that you have a growing relationship with Jesus today. Because it's not about you. Maybe your grandchildren are going to grow up and come to faith because of what God does for you. And what you're going to get to share with your grandchildren about. Listen, some of you parents, your kids are walking out this relationship with Jesus. And you need to go first. You need to make sure that you have a growing relationship with God. Because God wants to do things in your children, in your grandchildren. And He's going to do it through what you share with your kids about God, what He does for you, how He comes through for you. So here's what I want to do. I want to read some of the Bible to everybody this morning. Because in the book of Jeremiah, God tells His people what He's going to do when Jesus shows up. And this is what He says about every person that calls themselves a Christian, every person that believes in Jesus. This is what the Bible says. This is what God, this is the mouth of God. All right? Saying this to you this morning, Christian. Saying this to me. I will make with them an everlasting covenant. I will not turn away from doing good to them. I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they can't turn from me. Listen to this. Please hear me. God says, I will rejoice in doing them good. I'll plant them in the land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. God says that I'm going to rejoice in doing good to my people. It pleases God to bless his kids. God loves doing good things. But what we see doesn't always look like good things. In Psalm 23, David says this about God, that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Every day, if you belong to Jesus, you know what's coming behind you? Goodness and mercy. And I can see the look on some faces here this morning. You're, you're looking at me going, Caleb, how can cancer, how can my mom's cancer be goodness and mercy to me? How can me losing my job be God's goodness and God's mercy to me? And here's the answer. I don't know. But I can promise you that if you will just wait, the Bible promises. It's a promise. You can build your life on the promises of God or you can try to figure it out on your own. But the Bible promises that those of us who belong to God, the only thing that you'll experience for the rest of your life, whether it looks like it or not, is God's goodness and God's mercy. All the punishment for what you've done is gone. 
All God's wrath on your life for the mistakes you've made, for the sins you've committed, it's gone. Because of Jesus, not because of anything you do, not because of anything I've done. This is the most beautiful thing about being a Christian. It's not up to me. Listen, church, it's not up to you. God loves you. He cares for you. He created you to be satisfied by Him and by Him alone. So I don't know the end of your story. I don't know what's going to happen 20 year, in the next 20 years for you or 30 years or tomorrow. I don't, I don't have that gift. But I know what happened to Job. Look at what the Bible says. Job chapter 42, after years of feeling like God's just quiet. He's not saying anything. Not doing anything. Years. Look at what the Bible says happens to Job. Chapter 42. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 donkeys. Gives him all of his kids back. And please hear me this morning. I'm not telling you that God will make you rich. I don't know. I'm not telling you that God's going to give you everything that you want. I'm not telling you that. What I'm telling you is it doesn't matter. Because the offer he has for you is eternal joy, is eternal peace, eternal satisfaction. It's better than money. It's better than possessions. It's better than anything. It's a relationship with the God who created you and the offer's on the table free this morning, church. It's free to anybody who will take it. It doesn't matter. Forget the last 30 years of your life. Forget the last 70 years of your life. They don't matter. The mercies of God are brand new today. God is alive today and offers the relationship right this second. I want to close with this story. I want you to hear me say this. There's two things in this entire world I'm deathly afraid of, okay? And both of them are fairly irrational, and I understand that. One of them is spiders. It's just the way it is. I'm terrified of them, okay? And then the second one, listen, I don't care if you're six foot, 10, 350 pounds, you might wear my butt out, but I'll, I'll fight you. I'm not scared of you, okay? But I am terrified of the dark, right? <laughs> like, and I know this is more irrational now that I own guns and that I'm like kind of a grown up so I can like handle myself. But, but here's, here's what I was thinking about in preparing this message. I feel like God laid this on my heart to share with you guys. When you're little, you're terrified of the dark, right? You don't have a clue what's in your closet or what's in the dark or, you know, because you can't see. You're very, you're vulnerable in the dark. You can't protect yourself. But listen, church, when my dad came in the room with me, it didn't matter what's in the dark. You hear me? It doesn't matter what's in the dark. It doesn't matter what's in my closet. It doesn't matter if there's somebody under my bed. It doesn't matter because my father was stronger and more powerful and could beat up anything that was in my room. And so the message I have for you this morning, church, for you today is that it doesn't matter where you are, what your situation is. It doesn't matter because your God is with you and he loves you and he sent his Holy Spirit to seal that promise that I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I rejoice in doing good to you and that everything that happens to you for the rest of your life, if you belong to me, is God's goodness. It's my goodness for you. It's my mercy on your life. But hear me say this very clearly, church. That promise does not stand for every person in this room. There's one condition for having God's goodness and mercy follow you the rest of your life. And what you have to do, the one thing you have to do, you could be completely wrapped up in sin for the last 80 years of your life. And the one thing you have to do today is just say, God, thank you for sending Jesus. Let him take my punishment. That's the offer on the table today. Freedom, joy, peace. If you only will just, just recognize what God has already done. He sent his only son, the only one he had, so that people like me and people like you who can't seem to get it right, so that we can be made right in his eyes. All the punishment for our sins, all the wrath of God, completely gone. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus. 
So I want us to pray again right now. So if you want to bow your head and close your eyes. Here's, here's what I, I think I know. And in a room this large at every campus with as many people as are hearing this, I know that there's some people in here today that you, you, you have a relationship with God. You have a growing relationship with God. And today he's spoken something into your life and you want to move forward in that. But here's what I also know. There's some people here today, you don't have a relationship with God because of what Jesus has done for you. You've never responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've never wanted, you've never said, God, I repent from my sins. Please take my punishment away. And the offer's on the table today, church. So with every head bowed and every eye closed across every campus, if today you want your relationship with your Father restored, I just want you to raise your hand across every campus. Just raise your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, if your hand's raised, raise it high. There's no shame in this game. This is the best decision that's ever happened. This is God calling you back home. This is God restoring your relationship with him. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody who raised your hand, I want you to look at me. Everybody else, you just pray. You do some business with God right now. Everybody who had your hand raised, look at me. Forget your past. It's not your burden to carry anymore. Jesus willingly took the punishment for that so that you don't have to live in the past anymore. So today, it starts brand new. You're brand new. God sees you today as perfect as you could be because of Jesus. So here's what I want to invite you to do. If you raised your hand on every campus, I want you to stand to your feet and I want you to walk out of your aisle There's people in the back that want to give you something. They want to give you a Bible to help you learn how to read it. They want to walk. They want to help you figure out how to walk in this relationship. There's nothing to be ashamed of right now. Listen, you need this. I promise you need this. So if you made that decision today, go ahead and stand up and head to the back of the auditorium. There's someone back there who wants to connect with you. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody else, um, you can go ahead and look at me. We're going to end our service a little bit differently today, church, because I feel like I wouldn't be doing anybody any favors if we didn't give you an opportunity to respond. We didn't give everybody an opportunity in here to just move because of what Jesus has done for them. So I'm going to lead our church in a song. And all we're saying in this is, God, just give me you. I've I've had everything else. I just want you. And some of you, it looks a little bit different for you today. Some of you, you need to sit right where you are when we sing this. And you need to pray and do some business with the Lord. You need to say thank you. You need to repent of some things. Some of you, you need to stand to your feet and lift your hands high and sing this. Some of you, you need to go out and talk to somebody. I don't know what you need to do. But here's my honest to goodness belief. Here's what I'm convinced of. That the spirit of the living God doesn't just talk to me. I believe he's in this room right now and he's speaking to his people. So you know what God wants you to do today. I don't have to stand on stage and tell you. Nobody has to come on stage and tell you what to do. Respond. Don't harden your hearts. Move. So we're going to sing together. And if you want to sing, stand and sing. On every campus, stand and sing if you want to. If not, sit there and pray.
We turn our backs on you. We run away from you a thousand times. And it doesn't stop you from coming back and getting us. You love us more than we earn. You love us more than we deserve. God, you love us more than we ask for. And you're willing to write it all off if we will just come back to you. So, Father, my prayer today, with a church full of people that confess that we need you, God. We have to have you come through for us. We can't do it on our own. We're not strong. We're not powerful. We can't do it, God. Will you please, please give us faith to believe your promises so we can build our life upon them? Will you please, God, turn our hearts back to you? Open our eyes to see you. Help us to fall in love with you. Please. You're the only thing good about any of us. We need you so bad. Thank you for what you've done in this place today, Jesus. Thank you for what you promise to continue to do in our lives. To carry this work on to completion. We're very grateful for you, Jesus. All that God's people said. Amen. Listen, church. Thank God for what he's done for you. If he never does another thing for us, he's done way too much. Nobody's earned. Nobody's righteous. Nobody's without sin. Nobody's a good person. But God says, I love you anyways. There are a million people around us that need to hear that message. Every person you know needs to hear that God loves them despite what they do. Every person, everybody you come in contact with for the rest of the day, your waiter, everybody that you see for the rest of this week, they need to know that God loves them despite what they do. There's people that we are friends with. Maybe it's even us. We, they like to brag about their sins, right? They glory in their sins. You know as well as I do, it's a burden on their back. It's weighing them down. They're just looking for an out. They're looking for a way to get rid of it. And Jesus Christ inside of each of us has the keys to freedom for them. Take it to them this week, church. Let's go. We love you. Have a great week. We'll see you all back next week.